Hello there and welcome to the motoring programme that hooks you on its axle and takes you dizzily spinning round the frenzied heart of the car universe. That's right, you're watching Four Wheels Good. On the show today we enjoy an afternoon out with the elder statesman of classic cars, John Stanley, who's been driving yet another supercar. We join Mike Rutherford as he takes a hair-raising spin with world rally car driver Colin McRae. And John Wright taps his magician's hat with a spanner and pulls out not a rabbit, but a mechanical miracle in Inside Motors. But first we're off down to Malden and Essex, where another mechanic has been performing a kind of magic on cars, which most people can only dream about, Ferraris. Here I am in Malden in Essex and I'm surrounded by these stunning Ferraris. But I'm not here only to have a look at these stunning machines. I'm here to meet the man who lives many a boy's boyhood dream. It is engine builder and restorer Terry Hoyle. After leaving school I went to work for a Formula One team, Gilby Engineering, Sid Green and his son Keith Green. And I worked there for a year or so and then I went to Cosworth. Now most people have heard of Cosworth Engineering, Formula One and other things. Loved engine building, always have loved engine building. Um, stayed there for a while, then went to Ferraris, Marinello Concessionaires, who were the concessionaires for the Ferrari cars, now known as Ferrari UK, but this was in the 60s. And I stayed there until I got married the first time round. I, I asked the Colonel for a rise so I could buy a house. He said, people work here for nothing. And with that, I left. <laughs> was it always a desire of yours to work for a Ferrari then? Well, I think it's every schoolboy's dream to want to have something to do with Ferraris, preferably own one, if not work on them or look at them. So yes, it was all perfect for me. And then when I left Ferraris, I went to Ford competitions in the engine shop, built London Mexico engines, uh, London Sydney engines, all the rally team. And in the 70s, 72, I left there and started on my own in Malden. And from that, we built rally engines, won the World Championship, won the British Championship, European Championship, all the boring championships with rally engines, did the works Quattros, the works Fords, and I was able to buy my own Ferrari because it was always a dream. And then one thing went to another and um, I ended up doing more classic Ferraris than rally engines. And that's the way the business has gone now. We are now totally committed to Ferraris on this side of the business and Rolls-Royce Merlin engines on the other side of the business. We no longer do any rally engines. We're too busy with what you see here. So what's your preference? I mean, I know you do quite a lot of restoration. Well, what do you prefer? The older Ferrari cars to restore. I mean, obviously we service the modern ones, but it hasn't, they haven't quite got the same passion, haven't got quite the same history, or the interest for that matter. So where did the love of building engines come from? I don't know. It's just at Cosworth I was trained properly to do the job properly and always have been very, very interested in engines. I like the cars but I like the engines far more. Terry, when you think of Ferraris you generally think that they're red but this one's silver. What's the history behind it? Well, there's no particular reason why it should be silver it's just the customer's personal preference he wanted it silver and he asked for this stripe through with a white pinstripe there's no other reason for this they do normally come in red and it does make a change to see a different car in a different color so what's the history behind this car this model in particular well, this particular car started off in the body shape you see but made in steel uh, from when it left the factory it then was crashed it had a gto style body put on later Another customer decided he didn't want the GTO body on it, so our job was to take the GTO body off and reproduce another short work based body, but in aluminium. So what's so nice about this particular model? It's very user friendly, um, it's very easy to drive, it has a 3 litre V12 with a 4 speed gearbox, very nice to drive, you could go to historic rallies, historic meetings, social events, 
or just drive it on a Sunday morning. It's just a nice car. They're very sought after, especially the aluminium ones. Now, Terry, this one's a bit more of a racier model. In fact, lots of photographs that you see of Ferraris. You do see this one in them, don't you? Yes, very famous car called the 250 GTO. Uh, it was only 36 made in 1961, 62. Very expensive, fairly rare. They all still exist. Now, I know you restore the cars a lot of the time, but have you ever, ever wanted to race yourself? No, not really. I've been very fortunate during my life to go with very professional, experienced drivers. And when you sit alongside them, you realise you haven't a clue, really. You think you're quick when you're going to work and being Jack the Lad, but when you're actually sitting next to a professional, you realise I'm better with the spanners than I'm driving. Well, Terry, I've discovered this one, and although it's red, it's definitely not a Ferrari. So what can you tell me about the history behind it? This is a Maserati 250F, 1957, uh, Formula One car from that era. People like Fangio drove it very successfully. Not this particular car, but a car like it. Yes, super, super car. It may not be a Ferrari, but it's still a super car. So what are you doing to this particular model? This one, we're going to take the engine out. You can see it's on the hook now. We're going to take the engine out. It has water in the combustion chamber. We know that from our bore scope. And then we're going to remove the transaxle and all the suspension and rebuild it all. We won't touch the bodywork or some of the, you know, like the instruments and the dash, we won't touch that at all. So what will it be used for after that? I'm not sure. I think it may be raced in historic racing in this country, but my customer has just bought it. He cannot sell it on with the water in the engine and with a slight transmission noise, so my brief is to make it right and then he'll decide what to do with it. I mean, it's quite a unique car, isn't it? It's a very special car. This particular car was used as a test bed by Vandervelles for the Van Wall, which became an all-conquering British car. And this Maserati was sold by Maseratis to Vandervelles, less the engine, purely as a test bed. So it, this car is quite famous, yes. So what do you get the most satisfaction from? I suppose really working on the dynamometer. So once you've built the engine, you put it on the dynamometer, you test to see that your work is what it's supposed to be, and you sometimes can allow to do some development. Depends on what the customer wants. But that's the interesting part for me, to see it actually work and happen to breathe. Every engine we build on the premises, we bring in here and we set up so we can run it in, set the ignition timing, set the carburation, chain tensioner, that sort of thing. And if need be, we can do some development. But every engine we build here goes on this test bed. So is this where you will find out if there's any sort of major problems at all? Yes, we find out if there's any major problems, if there's any oil leaks, any knocking or something we're not happy with. And if we're not happy with it here, A, the customer doesn't get it and B, we wouldn't put it in the car up anyway. Do you still do the work on them yourself? Sometimes. Engine work. I like to tune carburettors. Uh, this is one of my sort of fortes. I like to tune carburettors, especially the six twin chokes. I don't get under cars now and change gearboxes and clutches and axles. I like to think I'm too old for that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. N not my scene, really. Engine. Keep to engines, I'm fine. I'm currently uh, working on a Formula One engine myself, getting my own hands dirty, not a problem. Well after all that noise and looking at all of these fantastic cars it's time for Terry and I to take it away and have a spin. Take it away Terry. fantastic cars and so many of them all in one place. Well, another kind of supercar is the one belonging to Colin McRae. His Subaru thrashes round the World Rally Championship at alarming speeds, but how can a driver at that level actually keep the car on the track at such a pace? We sent Mike Rutherford to be alarmed. It always staggers me that the steering wheel is so close to you guys. You know, I, yeah. all these, all these it, it, visions of uh, Sterling Moss, you know, driving like this. Yeah. How come he's gone from this to this? It's just to get more leverage on it. Your arm's a lot stronger in that yeah. angle. You know, when it's away out there, you've got no yeah. strength in them at all. Yeah. So you need to have it there. So if you get it caught, you, know, yeah. you can hold it. Right. Okay. They just ask the question. Okay. Go around. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. 
the first thing I noticed, Colin, is you're going you're going the wrong way for the corner. You're going in the opposite direction yeah, to the way you should be going. If you come, oh my come God, straight and break and just turn because it's such a slippy surface. Oh, you get a bit of understeer, what we call understeer. <laughs> the car will just push straight on. <laughs> so you need to really get it break the traction in the rear. Through the water. Oh. I think I've done my neck in. <laughs> oh, gee, this is... Oh, oh my God, we're going to come off, surely. Oh. Yeah, racing drivers depend on 100% grip all the time. We actually break the traction. We rely on the car braking traction and this loose surface to get it to turn in these corners. We're never going to make it. Oh. oh, the back end goes out there. Get a nice slide on right Oh, here. that is... Oh! <laughs> this is a slippy one. It's all grass through here. Cut the corner a bit here. And <laughs> you kind of slightly went off... Oh, there's this metal post. We missed it by about an inch. This is a real slippy surface here. You just have to put the dab the brakes a bit before oh. where you want to break just to test the grip on the road. I can't believe he's going this speed on a road like this, on a track like this. Usually unruffled Mike Rutherford there enjoying a thoroughly ruffling experience. It's time now for a break. Join us afterwards when we'll be driving class and power with John Stanley. And the other John, our Mr Wright, will be cleaning the heart of all things dear inside motors. Welcome back to the show which takes you on a delirious drive around the heart of the motoring world, four wheels good. Cultured classic car expert John Stanley has driven many fast and powerful motors in his time, but it's not always the case that they're solid and comfortable at the same time. This week he's been cruising in a real fortress that combines power, luxury and refinement, the BMW 740ci. Prestige is an age-old symbol. We're in Norwich Cathedral. Norman spent 50 years building this and the city spent another 300 years creating the upgraded definitive statement. The spire itself is the second tallest in Great Britain. However, impressing people with power and wealth is not the exclusive domain of the church. Take for instance BMW's flagship, the 850 series. When it was first announced in 1990, 1,000 UK residents requested and queued to spend £60,000 in order to own one. It boasted a huge 5-litre V12 engine and it offered 300 brake horsepower just for the extra prestige. It was the first production car with multiplex wiring. It was the first V12 with a 6 gear change. It gained all kinds of prestige but inevitably got a reputation for being overweight and for underperforming. So in 1992, BMW Motorsports division answered with an extraordinary 850 CSI with a staggering 5.6 litre engine and an 80, no less 80,000 pound price tag. Critics unfortunately parked it alongside the big Mercedes SLs and the huge Porsche 928. It was not succeeding. Undaunted, BMW turned to their lighter V8 unit and in 1994 they launched the 840Ci which grew into this 840Ci Sports which in a single year has sold more than the four years of the V12 put together. So what does it offer? First of all you have this huge V8 engine that has been enlarged to 4.4 and can give you 286 brake horsepower. Then you have state-of-the-art spoilers, front and rear, and you have a set of wheels for which you pay a lot of money and which you can guarantee to lose any car sponge. Wonderful little nuggets all the way around. Everything inside is perfectly trimmed, all in high quality leather. These seats and headrests have their own safety harness built into them, 
so as to allow you all the joys that are traditionally with the BMW Coupe's pillarless side windows. The rear seats offer no more than the Jag XK8 or the Aston DB7 rivals, but in the boot it's nearly twice the size of the DB7, despite the DB7 costing 20,000 more, and it's even larger than the impressive XK8s. £60,000 is a lot to spend on a two-door car, and it's not until you drive this machine that you begin to understand its true values. Grand Tourers are not currently fashionable, but for anyone seeking a prestige Highway Express, this is a masterpiece. The onboard computer is quite a standard fixture with the BMW. I ran a 6 Series in California way back in the late 1970s, and the bloody thing never stopped pinging and ringing and in the end the BMW couldn't sort it and I swapped it for a Jaguar. This I have to say is rather better and if you press the knob it gives you all the standard displays that you need and it can also keep you street legal because if you select the limiter and you press the appropriate button it tells me 29 is all we can go here without getting illegal and there you go I'm breaking the law we'll switch it off quickly. On the open road it's silky smooth. The automatic box is a, a joy really as you'd expect of BMW. There is the extra advantage of being able to knock it sideways and then use the power of the V8 by holding each gear until the optimum position for change. That gives you really all the performance you could possibly hope for. There is however a serious hidden secret in this car and although the car may have had a checkered past, this gearbox I adore. All you have to do is flick it. And it's like a sequential box off a touring race car. That's all it takes. And when you drop down, as I shall now, from fifth to fourth to third, and at times with coming out of the limit, you can see just what it does. All it takes, heaven. Needless to say, a V8 engine under ordinary road conditions really does nothing for a living. Um, we're doing only a thousand revs here and we're at 50 miles an hour. It makes the power consumption surprisingly good for a V8. It averages at around uh, 20 miles per gallon and there's a limited top speed for those who've got a race circuit in their back garden of 155. The handling is very, very impressive. It's lowered because it's got the M Sport setup it's 15 millimeters down and it really corners completely flat and one of the dangers with such a well insulated car is that you really don't know the speed you're going around the corners unless you look down. The build quality is wonderful and it does give you a great sense of safety and of control. In fact, it's a joy to drive. All those centuries ago, protection also worried the monks that ran this great Norwich Cathedral. They built four secure exits from this great close, three massive houses that were in fact gatehouses, and a fourth directly onto the water just for insurance. It does appear then or now, money can buy you great comfort and protection. John will be back soon with yet another car that will have us drooling on our TV sets. Well, it's time now to go over to the studio garage where our resident experts engines in bits. Come on, John, get it together for Inside Motors. Welcome back to Inside Motors. Last week you saw us at the machine shop having all the bits for the midget engine reconditioned. Now it's our job to put it back together again. These are the bits here that we had done. Now the block, the head, the crankshaft. Now before we go ahead and do some building, there's just a couple of books I'd like to recommend to you. Uh, now with most things there's usually only one manual, the Haynes manual 
that cause the car. However, when it comes to A-series engine and midgets, you've got the standard Haynes manual, you've got David Vizard's tuning A-series engines, which is the absolute bible for these engines. Slightly technical, but it covers absolutely everything. And the third one, again, it's another Haynes publication, but it's by Lindsay Porter, and it's about the restoration of the midget and the sprite. Those three books, a little bit of like bedtime reading for you. I'm going to put them to one side. We will be referring to them later because I just can't remember all the facts and figures and the torque settings and everything that I need to do to build this engine. Right, this is the block that we had bored, honed and surface ground and we also had it cleaned for us. However, when it comes to engines, cleanliness is absolutely next to godliness. As you can see, I'm wearing a clean overall, we've got a clean bench and lots of clean rags. Now, the one thing we must do is make sure that the oilways are clear. Now, that there on an A-series engine doesn't normally have a tap-in. And we, over the weekend, drilled and tapped that in preparation for making sure that the oilways are clear. Now, the way I like to do it is get a bit of a welding rod and tie a rag to the end. Dip that into a solvent, which can be anything but petrol. Uh, red diesel's good, white diesel, paraffin or kerosene. Kerosene's probably the cheapest. We've got red diesel in this, but it doesn't matter. And put it through the oil gallery from that end so that it comes out. Now, can you see why I wanted to re-clean that? It's still full of dirt, grit and swarf. Let's get rid of that. I might pull that all the way through. I've bent it over at this end, so I'm just going to cut it off. Because I want to pull that all the way through. I don't want to put that back in again. Our mustachioed Mr Fixit will carry on with his mission of MG Motor Mechanics next week. Also in next week's programme, I'll be having fun driving an original concept from Skoda. Steve Parker, our stateside correspondent, will be reporting on drag racing in the US. And Ginny Buckley will be testing a modern British sports car, the Noble M10. Have a good week. See you then. <laughs>